we'll now be uh, moving on to um, the panel discussion moderated by Dimitris Belbas, Managing Director and Head of Shipping Finance at CFIN, on the topic of resilience in adversity, operations, investments, and finance. The shipping markets, as you have seen in our in the last two presentations, have had a roller coaster 2020 so far, and little clarity remains on the months ahead. In this panel discussion, Singapore-based ship owners and operators comment on operations, investments, and finance, and whether any degree of predictability is possible for 2021. Gentlemen, if you could uh, turn on your um, cameras and, and your microphones. Um, Joining Dimitris on the panel um, is uh, Chor Yang Tan, who's the head of group finance at AET Tankers, Marcus Wenker, chief financial officer at FSL Trust, and Alan Hatton, managing director at Foreguard Shipping. Before I hand over the floor to Dimitris, just a, a few ground rules. The audience will be on mute as, as you have been uh, throughout this session uh, to ensure quality control. Um, You'll, be, you'll see um, um, a, a control panel on the right of your screen like that. Uh, if you want to ask a question to the panel, you simply need to enter your question in the box at the bottom of the control panel where it says questions, and I will receive them. And at the end of the webinar, at the end of the panel discussion, I will ask the questions on your behalf. You can also collapse the menu by clicking on the little arrow on the top of the control panel. Dimitris, over to you. Thank you very much, Andrew. And a big thank you to my three co-panelists for today, Cho Yang, Marcus, and uh, Alan. The topic of our discussion is resilience in adversity. And I highly recommend the movie Tenet for a big screen demonstration of both adversity and resilience for the ones at least who can uh, still go to a movie theater these days. Tenet is a time-twisting movie. In the last two years, to be honest, felt a lot like that. We spent all of 2019 talking about IMO 2020. And come 2020, we're only talking about COVID-19. Now, volatility and uncertainty have been the recurring themes of the year thus far. So I would like to start by asking, asking my three panelists, okay? From the operations perspective, what has been the biggest challenge in 2020 in managing your fleet's operations? So, Jan, would you like to start? Sure. Um, thanks, Dimitris. Um, perhaps before I start, uh, let me give a brief uh, introduction of AET. Um, we are a petroleum tanker owner operator uh, with a fleet of about 80 vessels, uh, ranging from BLCCs, DP shuttle tankers, um, where we are growing our presence, uh, mid sized tankers, Aframax and Swiss Max, uh, with our operations mainly light rings in um, the US Gulf as well as the uh, Latin Americas. Um, and we have a boutique uh, fleet of uh, product tankers as well. Um, so coming back to the question, the biggest challenge um, in 2020, I think um, we will definitely not be able to move away from uh, the impact from COVID. Uh, and I'm sure um, everyone else within the shipping industry would be feeling the same. Um, we would be impacted by the various port restrictions, uh, which has made it difficult uh, for crew changes to happen. Um, and this has obviously put a strain on um, not just seafarers, our seafarers, but also on their family. So since March 2020, we have been um, rerouting our vessels and diverting our vessels to enable all these crew changes to take place so that we can do our best to bring our, our ferrous home, seafarers home. And we will continue um, to do what is uh, necessary um, and working very closely with the shipping organizations, with the port authorities, with the various authorities to continue to facilitate um, uh, the, the bringing back to our crew home, um, facilitating the crew changes uh, so that we can actually um, um, help them to our best abilities. Thanks. Thank you very much. Marcos, from your end. Basically, it's, I can just echo what Joe Young just mentioned it is crew manage uh, crew changes. It will continue to be crew changes. Um, we also had to deviate vessels to facilitate crew changes. Um, the whole logistics around crew changes have become a complete nightmare. This includes um, planning well ahead. Um, this includes uh, quarantine for crews. Um, this unfortunately expresses itself in 
significantly increased cost of crew changes, um, leaving aside the cost of deviating vessels. Um, but this is basically the number one issue operationally um, that, that the COVID-19 pandemic has created for us. And as we basically have third-party ship managers managing our vessels, this also requires a very close coordination with those third-party ship managers, as well as the charter. So if we if we sell a vessel, when we sell a vessel, also with the seller uh, with the buyers of the vessel. Thank you very much, Alan. I rely on you for a different answer. I'm I'm very sorry to disappoint, um, but I think <laughs> I think if you ask any owner at the moment, and certainly you know I think it's been not just echoed on the panel, but echoed generally, that the biggest challenge this year has thus far been uh, how we manage the crews on the ships. And I think one part that I will say is slightly different, in, as well as just repatriating crew and making sure they get home safely, I think another factor that's very, very important is making sure that people that come on board are healthy, that they've been through the right checks. And then also in every uh, port that we call, any terminal that we call, any time we load or discharge, we're trying to make sure that the access to the ship and the interaction that the crew have with people port side is managed as well as possible as well, because I think that's something that, that is always difficult to, to, to keep a lid on. And it's something that, that we're very keen to make sure we manage to keep the crews that are now on board our ships each time healthy as well. But certainly that the manning issue, because of the deviation, because of the crew changes, uh, the cost involved, the time involved, the potential quarantine, that's been the biggest challenge thus far this year. Okay, so let, let me try to ask you a question aiming to a different answer this time. Internally, what has been, if you want, in your own personal view, the, the most important success factor in tackling this challenge? You know, obviously, crew changes have been even, thankfully, made the news, if you want, to big news media, okay, saying about, you know, what the, the the crew and the seamen are going through, but within within your own respected companies, what has been, if you want, the biggest uh, is it success uh, factor? Is it ingredient in the culture, Alan? Uh, I think communication for us. We we're a, a small ship owner. We've got very lean organisation. Communication lines are very direct. Um, we all talk about the main issues that we're facing and we have to resolve them very quickly and make decisions very quickly um, and I think that network internally married with the relationships that we have with our charterers and, and third-party managers as well we use third-party um, technical uh, that's been that's been the key and has able it enabled us to facilitate working from home seamlessly and, and all of those different things that seemed a little bit impossible um, eight nine months ago mm -hmm. uh, Marcus Again, just echoing what Alan said, it's communication. It's being um, very proactive about things and planning ahead, because uh, unless we plan in times of COVID-19, um, it's it's impossible to facilitate things like crew changes. Office-wise, it's also like direct communication, fast decision making, and uh, and also working from home where. Uh, certainly this is a new challenge to people especially because we have been doing this now for what six months and uh, it is something different than working from home for a day or, or a week uh, to work from home six months and to be disciplined throughout this period and to constantly work and keep up um, with, the, with the topics and the issues is, is certainly a great achievement of all people in our organization. So Jan. Okay, let me let me try a different answer. Um, for me, um, I think people, human capital is, is very important. I think um, the team within AET would have to be very close, uh, very committed to the common cause, um, demonstrating our care and concern for our seafarers. I think this is this is also very important on top of um, you know good communication. You know, good communication. Okay, very good. Now, if Let's say we are able as an industry to tackle this very you know, big challenge you know, of, the, of the crew changes and uh, the most efficient operation on board of the ships. What do you expect to be the biggest challenge going forward? Assuming we have tackled this one, what will be next? What, or actually what is top you know, on the next page? 
of your you know morning briefing marcus it remains related to COVID-19, basically. It's, uh, I mean, in, in here we are seeing uh, massively increasing uh, numbers of new cases. Um, there are new lockdowns so far locally. Um, I don't want to imagine what happens if there are nationwide new lockdowns. Uh, this has a massive impact on the whole value chain where shipping is part of. And, uh, and this will definitely impact our operations. A second aspect is um, is that um, when when we want to try, uh, to fly um, superintendents or, or technicians or stuff like that to to vessels, that's not related to crew changes. That's in the daily operations of the vessels. Um, this is also made much more difficult because of the travel restrictions. And lastly, um, when it comes to to um, to SNP, um, where buyers and sellers uh, um, or buyers usually want to have their own superintendents inspecting the vessels, so this will also have an impact on longer term on um, on the S and P market. So, okay. Jan. Um, well, for us, um, on top of the um, usual commitment to operation excellence, good HSSE in terms of safety, I think the challenge is how do we incorporate our ESG agenda on top of all this. How do we actually um, commit ourselves more to the environment cost, environmental cost? You know, whether it's IMO 2030, IMO 2050, or even from a social angle, how do we attract talent into our shipping industry? How do we invest and give back more to the community? I think this will be the key focus for us going forward, on top of our usual focus on safety and operations. Alan? Um, well, I mean, clearly, the near term is, is is COVID and related issues. I think beyond that, we'll see how much that impacts the markets that are adjacent and interactive with shipping. Um, from a financing point of view, how, how readily available financing for new projects is, how um, able we are to attract capital for new ideas that we have and things that we want to do. That goes hand in hand with, with the conversation around ESG and propulsion and, and picking the right um, time and horse to back. Um, and I think, you know, really, what we will, what we will be looking to do is, is to see how we can move forward and, and, and maintain the growth of the business going forward, despite the backdrop of all this uncertainty and, and, and economic difficulty. I think uh, excellent pass for the next, if you want, topic, which is investments. Okay, in order to grow, we need to, you know, invest in our shipping companies. Um, there's been, if you want, some ups and downs in the S&P activity thus far. Marcus talked about the challenges in, you know, in performing inspections. Um, what do you think, how, how do you see the S&P market for the rest of 2020 and 2021 and, and why? Alan, would you like to start? Happy to. I mean, I think, well, I think there'll still be activity. I think that as long as there is the opportunistic ability to acquire tonnage uh, or in a way that, that, that looks attractive, then, then capital will come. And I think there is capital waiting by the decide to invest in, in, in specific opportunities as and when um, that there is that they become open i think it's challenging to a degree for perhaps listed companies to acquire tonnage while um, they're trading at discounts to any beers we've seen that, that that always is quite a challenge but i think the private owners that are sat by the wayside um you know particularly at a time when the order book is a 30-year low uh, will we'll see opportunity and and if there's one thing we've seen, you know, there will always be activity if there's opportunity. So, Jan? Um, well, for, for the tanker side, um, we have seen very strong uh, increased activities in Q4 last year um, and Q1 early this year. Um, but going forward, um, we believe that it will slow down. Yes, I think there will still be activities. So I, I do agree with uh, Alan. Um, there's still going to be money out there. Um, but in terms of um, how active the market will be, we believe that it's going to slow down. In fact, uh, over the next few years, um, that's, that's how we see it. Yeah. Marcus, you, the, the company, the trust has been active in the last couple of months. How do you see the rest of the year? Yeah, we, we were active on the sales side, but uh, this was uh, there were different uh, motivations. I mean, earlier this year, we, uh, we sold uh, some tankers at very good prices 
um, where we were certainly benefiting from uh, the very firm tanker markets we, we have seen. Um, on the container ships, the story was was completely different. They were depreciated. The, the charter charters ended, um, so there was no upside, no downside. Um, going forward, I agree with Choi Yang in the tanker side. Um, there will be some activity, but it it will be fairly muted simply because the market values have dropped so significantly from what we have seen in the first half of this year that sellers who don't have to sell will rather wait during this time of uncertainty probably um, in the other segments as ellen um, already mentioned where there's an opportunity there will be a buyer um, the acquisitions will in, in my mind be rather speculative simply because we currently have a very high uncertainty as to how long the situation with COVID-19 with a global pandemic will last and literally nobody can really make an educated guess on this so it's, it's a bit of a lottery game um, on, on predicting um, when the market will kind of normalize and what the ultimate impact is certainly there will be a cascade effect on the real economy and we have already seen that in, in, in across the world basically that there were that there have been layoffs of people um the aviation industry has hit hard which will also have an impact certainly on on the shipping industry so there is extreme uncertainty right now where it is difficult and impossible to make an educated guess mm -hmm. so uh, yeah. yeah we all if you want leave and uh breathe in Singapore, as the bank logo goes. Uh, what do you think will be the impact of the ocean tankers fleet disposal in the market or the impact you know, to your investment decisions? I know it's a rather, if you want, timely plus sensitive topic. Um, Cho Yang? Well, um... In terms of impact to AET, uh, when it comes to investments on new capex um, or, or second-hand uh, tonnage, um, we have two key considerations. One is the availability of uh, contracts to justify the investment. And two, um, it will now have to be aligned um, to our long-term um, sustainability uh, agenda, um, which is more um, to be aligned with the IMO 20 and IMO 2050 targets. Um, so the focus for us going forward whenever it comes to investment is to ensure that we um, actually go after the eco-friendly, fuel-efficient vessels. And uh, for, for AET in particular, we do believe in LNG as transition fuel. So we also um, are focusing uh, our capex on um, LNG dual fuel vessels, for example. So in this case, um, looking at what's um, potentially available out there, um, I would think that at the moment there is uh, there is not going to be too much interest. I would say coming from AT. Okay, coming from AT, um, Alan, what do you think? What would be the market's interest? Um, well, look, I mean, I think it, it's clearly an interesting situation that, that's developed between Ocean Tankers and, and Jiha, the, the the owning side. I mean, I, th I don't think it's going to materially affect the way Orgard looks to invest. I mean, we're 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 not necessarily um, at the scale where a big fleet sale is going to be something that we uh, are competitive in. But I do think the impact of the way in which those processes are driven in Singapore um, could have quite significant effects on, on, on the business globally um, from the perspective that, first of all, all those assets, a lot of which are laid up or, or, or sat outside Singapore at the moment, need to get moving again and they need to be run properly. And then there's an awful lot of claims and other issues around them. And so that all needs to be managed carefully. And, and obviously, there'll be banks and other creditors looking to um, make an exit. And I think, you know, given just the size and scale of the, the number of ships that, that are uh, involved in those processes, then there needs to be some um, balance in terms of how and when they're, they're sold and, what, and, and the impact that that has on the market. I mean, there's 15, 16 plus VLCCs involved. I don't know how many were sold last year, maybe 30, 35 in, globally. And so when you're looking at that affecting um, the, the kind of balance of, of, of supply into the market, then clearly it could have quite a big impact. But in terms of impact from our perspective and of an investment decision, then I, I don't see a great deal 
uh, in terms of effect on full guy. Marcos, uh, you know, Ocean Tigers yes. have, you know, both dirty and, and clean vessels. I don't know, what is uh, and the it's, trust? It's, it's the same here. It doesn't have an impact on us, interestingly. Um, we were approached, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't really have an impact on us, on um, on the market, what Alan said. On, on the one hand, it has a positive effect because there's currently some tonnage idle, which certainly has, in the overall wheat market, a positive influence. But the big risk is that um, when all those vessels will be sold and will be sold in forces, that it might have a severe impact on market values. Okay, we saw if you run from the previous presentations how the, the supply and demand you know, looks going, going forward. Um, is this the time to divest, I'm sorry, is this the time to diversify into different asset types or sectors? Is this the time now to, for somebody to go and order a new building or focus more on secondhand tonnage? It's a little bit more, you know, open-ended. Let's say that, you know, your, your CEO will come or your board or your investors will come tomorrow and say, you know what? There's easy, cheap money out there. We're going to get you $1 billion. Okay, where should we do that? What should we do with that? What is there, you know, where where do you see the opportunities, you know, going forward? Alan said, you know, if the opportunities are there, people will, uh, you know, will definitely rise to the occasion. Um, Alan, what do you think? I mean, while we're focused on, on shipping to, to deploy that, then I, look, I mean, I, I think we've stated quite clearly in the past that from our perspective, we see more value in the secondhand market than the new build market at the moment. Um, but I think it very much depends on your drivers. Um, as we heard Troy Yang say, I mean, I think if you're if you're looking very much at where you're moving to and from an ESG perspective, where, where your business is going, then you can see why people are looking to develop those types of projects. Um, I just think at the moment there's such a, a discount in the secondhand market across the sectors that we look at. Um, you know, for example, uh, some some three or four year old uh, chemical tankers were sold at about a just over 30% discount to their new build price at this point in time. And if you can get that kind of um, discount at perfectly for ships that are operating perfectly well and that are that are high spec and modern, then that has to be thought about rather than going off to order. Certainly, as you don't have the working capital issue of putting down money for a, a, a new build. Um, you know, I think if, if you're ordering against contracts and there's a specific requirement for those ships, then the new building um, ordering, it can make some sense. I think speculative new building is, is, is quite dangerous at this point, certainly um, not least because you don't know what the rate environment will be when, when you're um, bringing that ship into the market, but also at this point in time, there's no real clarity as to how, how long the ship will have, a, have as a useful life with the propulsion system changes that are ongoing. Um, and so, and, and so really also from diversification point of view, I think you know there have been clear examples in the past where diversification across fleets has literally saved companies because of the balance of different um, timing of, of, of good and bad markets. But I think it's much better overall to kind of buy smart than to than to buy different. I think it's a matter of timing of entry and exit and running the ships properly. And so, I mean, I don't think diversification for diversification's sake is the right um, course. It's a matter of working out when the right time to 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 buy certain types of assets is and and, and the right market to put them into. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcus. You know, the, the trust two years ago placed a new building order. Okay, yeah, I think you're you're about to take delivery of the ships. Um, What's going to be? Is it going to be a combination of second hand? Is it going to be new, if you want acquisitions, it would be new buildings? I mean, the key motivation behind the two new buildings was basically ESG. Um, the new buildings are state of the art. The consumption is half of what the conventional um, LR2 tank consumes. Um, so, so the clear driver behind that was um, was ESG and looking into the future. Well, I completely agree with, uh, with Alan that the big question mark if we were to place an order today is what is the useful lifetime of the vessel because of a change in, in propulsion and change in fuel and unless this has been clarified it's extremely dangerous for an owner to order to place a new order without having long-term coverage long-term contract behind um, because nobody really knows what the residual value will be in the end so um, new buildings is a is a difficult animal 
these days and um, unless there's such a add-on i don't see us um, to place new buildings um, when it comes to um, diversification i think um, i personally am a big fan of diversification and um, this diversification does not only go with the types of assets um, an owner has but also the employment of assets um, to have a certain level of coverage a certain level of market exposure to to capture the upside and our current fleet for instance reflects that we we have a certain level of diversification even though we are now selling um, our container ships even within the container uh, within the tanker market where we are now left we have a diversification across different sizes and we have a diversification across different employments which i don't which i think is is very important um i don't think that because as a listed company um the, the capital markets especially in the us are more focused on pure play players because the asset allocation cross segment should be done by the investor the danger with that is that it could be too late if there's a, a very deep slump in one single sector and the company goes bust or has to to raise new capital at very high cost um, of diluting uh, existing shareholders so um, even for for listed companies i think that there's a huge advantage of um, diversification and to what ellen said is well, I'd say on the one hand agree that um, it is important to to buy at the right time. This does not exclude diversification because diversification also allows an active asset allocation across the different segments, which includes then again a, a good timing of acquisitions and disposals. So, Yang, you made a comment earlier on, if you want about your the company's presence, uh, preferences. Is there something you would like to add or? Sure. Um, yeah, let me start off by saying that um, COVID-19, we believe it, it has been a big reset to the shipping industry. And in particular, uh, for tankers market, for tanker sector, um, we do see that the global oil demand will be dropping going forward and it could perhaps have brought forward peak oil. But having said that, we, we, are still, we still believe that um, petroleum is still required. There's no short-term or medium-term replacement of petroleum. Um, so we, we, we will continue to be in this space. We believe in continuing to strengthen our core. Um, in terms of uh, investment opportunities, we will continue to invest um, on, on eco vessels, on fuel efficient vessels, both as um, for, for fleet rejuvenation um, for our existing older VLCCs or from excess, or expanding our presence perhaps in the DP space. But having said that, we do note of um, the inevitable energy transition that has already started, especially with the oil majors, or we call them energy majors nowadays. They have been slowly but surely investing in new energies or renewables. So for us, it is a space that we are uh, monitoring, we are looking at closely, um, because we, we do see opportunities um, for AET to continue uh, to work with and partner our clients, uh, particularly the, the majors, um, in these new ventures. So, so perhaps that's, that's, uh, that's uh, what's essentially solved. So, so. Okay, let's let's move to the if you want to the last <clears throat> topic, which is the finance. Okay, um, most banks, you know, especially if you want for us living in uh, in, in Singapore. We know that you know European banks have reduced their, if you want, exposure slash presence in uh, in Asia. They have, you know, uh, more or less some of them closed down the offices of their regional headquarters. Um, how do you see? And I'm not talking about your existing lenders. I'm talking about how do you see the appetite of banks to engage with new clients on new projects? Is this some? Do you do you see that banks actually being actively marketing, if you want, their services to new shipping clients? Um, Marcus, um, we have just worked on the financing of our two new builds, and um, the picture there, I think, is mixed. We have um, we have received offers from international banks, um, but we have also talked to international banks who clearly said that in the current situation. Um, we are not open to new business. Some have said we are open to new business, but we 
focus exclusively on existing customers. Um, so the, the picture is mixed. Um, but certainly ship finance will become more global in, in terms of its source. Yeah. Joe Young? Um, yes, I would like to echo Marcus' view, um, in particularly on the fact that uh, the banks are still around. For new clients, I suppose, um, from the bank's perspective, it is still back to the three keywords, flight to quality. I think they will be on the lookout for um, good clients, um, visible clients who are transparent, who has good business plan going forward, good business strategy going forward. Um, for AT, we have been actually quite active this year as well in terms of financing. We have closed a couple of financings. We are going uh, to close a few more. And this is more um, involving the financings from new buildings as well as some refinancing. So we have been working with our stable fleet of uh, banks, relationship banks, but uh, we are also um, getting new banks um, on board, uh, potentially. Um, so I believe uh, banks are still open um, for, for to, to consider new clients. And why not? Perhaps uh, if these banks have the capacity, it could be the best time for them to so-called cherry pick on, on the right clients. And, and just if I may add one point there, um, I think one very important consideration there is also what the defined ask of the, of the ship owner to the bank is, whether the bank will be open and interested to, to listen or not. Um, this is certainly something that um, we have experienced now in our, recent, uh, uh, in our recent discussions we have had with the lenders, um, where obviously um, banks were more open to listen when you say we are looking for something conservative and not to basically stretch it to the maximum that might be possible with some parties but um, certainly banks have also learned um, a few lessons over the past decade and uh, and try to not be uh, pro cyclical about things and and be aggressive alan what is your view um look, I, difficult to argue against any of those views i think um you know certainly uh, quality names will continue to attract service and coverage. Um, I think, you know, depending, it really does depend who you are when you when you go and talk to, to banks, um, even more so than perhaps the project that you bring. Um, I think very, you're, you're seeing far less focus on the, the, the asset kind of back financing deals rather than corporate finance deals these days. It's, it's normally the company and the balance sheet that's backing the project um, that seems to be the attraction. And in within that, a couple of different things, perhaps the the ability to to cross sell across the bank in you know, different products and and other things as well as the financing, and then also now as we mentioned with with the shipping companies, obviously the banks have got their own ESG concerns as well, and so so looking at much more kind of green financing solutions, um, is very much on their agenda. So I mean I think think there will be a flight towards projects that that have those um, credentials. Okay. I think, I think we are running a little bit out of time. So let me try to squeeze in two questions, you know. Um, stock markets have defied gravity, okay, especially especially in the US. Everybody was, you know, come, come March, everybody was more or less, you know, ready to go and, you know, invest. And whoever was in the stock market right now, you know, obviously is laughing all the way to the bank. Do you believe, and please keep it short because I want to ask you one more question after that. Do you believe that, Shipping has a future within capital markets. Okay, Marcus, you it's coming to you first. It's the only listed you, if you want company right now in the panel. What is the capital markets appetite for shipping? Um, I think um, shipping will continue to be relevant for the capital markets and vice versa. As a Singaporean company, though, I think um, we are more looking at the Eastern Hemisphere rather than the US capital market. And even with other um, Singapore-based com companies, I think the European market, the Norwegian market, is more relevant than the US market simply because of the 13 hours time difference, I think, plays, plays a role in there as well. Um, then I, I, I think there's um, a big deal around, and we have seen that in, in the previous um, presentation, basically, that pretty much all shipping companies trade below NAV, which makes it very unattractive right now to raise money. So unless we have an appreciation in uh, the valuations, um, I don't think that it will make a lot of sense for companies to 
to have the equity market at the at the very high cost of dilution. At the same time, what we have seen over the past decade basically is that um, there are certain companies that go to the capital markets again and again and completely destroy the reputation for all the shipping companies because they raise capital and two months later their market capitalization is below what they have raised just two months before. And this is something where we as an industry need to be be careful about because those companies are not doing a good service to the industry. This is why many investors don't touch the industry anymore because they're just touching the, the wrong projects and they get um, seduced by, by owners' um, stories uh, that they are told. And, and uh, we need to be careful about those things as an industry because it is cyclical. It will always be cyclical. It is volatile and uh, and we need to be a bit more sustainability in our in our stories we are telling to the capital markets. So Young, any views on capital markets and shipping? Um, <laughs> not yet. But but back to your question, um, I think the, the shipping stocks are still interesting, just to keep it short, but not for the film matter. <laughs> Alan. Um, all right. I could talk quite a lot about it, but I think to try and keep it very brief, I mean, it's interesting that you say that the stock markets defied gravity. It looks like gravity's kicked in quite hard for some of the shipping companies over the past few months. Um, and and there seems to be you know, still a dichotomy, certainly on the tanker side, between financial performance and share price performance over that period. Um, so sh that dislocation clearly means that other uh, forces are at play. I mean, I think going uh, agreeing with what Marcus said, I think unfortunately shipping has done a bit of a disservice to its investor base over the decade and beyond. Um, and repeatedly, I think Alpha Volca came out with something quite interesting recently in terms of the returns from dry bulk shipping over that kind of period, and, and, and it looks pretty woeful. So, I mean, I think where we are now, I can see there being a correction and just looking at the, at the metrics that we saw in the presentation previously and looking at where companies are trading, just as we see asset values and volatility in asset values and prices moving, we see that in shipping stocks as well. But while shipping stocks are most closely pegged to NAVs, then they're, they're going to move alongside asset price volatility, and they seem to be trading at a, at a discount most of the time. So whether or not we're going to find any real success stories that can depart from that correlation, I, I think that that's that's a, that's a, an interesting question and, and and one that we could argue about for hours. Okay. All right. So. Sure. Let me come to my last uh, question, and then I will you know, pass it on to Andrew in case you know the people who are listening to us have something more to ask. In your view, what do you believe is the biggest threat or the biggest advantage okay, for shipping finance going forward? Okay. Who would like to go first? I mean, the, the biggest advantage, obviously, is, um, is cost um, compared to the cost of equity. Um, and the biggest threat is um, new people entering the market who don't have the expertise and burn their fingers, number one. And the second is um, to land pro-cyclical and, uh, and then later on suffer losses and uh, again burn their fingers. Uh, and, and this is why we have seen banks exiting because uh, banks were, were pro-cyclical. And uh, in the interest of the oil industry again, and uh, in the interest because the regulators have become very much focused on shipping. And I mean, up until recently, I was a banker myself. I've experienced how um, how focused the ECB is on on shipping. Um, lenders don't do themselves and the industry a favor if they adopt cyclical lending behaviors. Mm -hmm. So young. Um, no, I I echo what uh, Marcus has said. Biggest threat for me actually are the borrowers, the shipping companies, and the lenders. Um, borrowers, why? Because uh, shipping companies, we will determine um, the part of the supply portion of the supply demand equilibrium. Um, and with us, let's say, not uh, being disciplined, uh, being overly aggressive, not looking at our balance sheet before we decide to invest, we can easily tilt the uh, the demand supply equilibrium into an equilibrium, um, therefore making banks you know, think twice before they, they land. Lenders, um, for me, they are a threat as well. There are banks coming in and out of uh, the shipping sector. Um, so 
they are not able to, they are not willing, in fact, to take a long-term view on shipping, um, looking at it as long-term relationship um, partnership thingy. Um, so with that, there will definitely be a trend to finance. Um, in terms of the biggest advantage, shipping is one of the oldest industries that mankind has known. I think it will still be around. Today, it is carrying about 80 to 90% of the world trade. It is still not um, an industry that can be replaced in the short term. So I definitely believe that banks who are able or willing to appreciate and understand shipping, appreciate and understand their shipping clients, there will also be money uh, to be made um, in cheap finance for them. Yeah. Alan. Um, look, I, I think a lot of the points that are that have been touched on uh, are all very valid. I also think, you know, obviously regulation has been an issue um, and the continued re re kind of new regulatory um, hurdles that, that come in have, have certainly not been particularly helpful for the allocation um, or capital cost of banks to, to try and lend into shipping. Um, I think looking at a few other things, what could be a threat and a, an advantage potentially is it, are the issues that we're having in aviation, real estate, other other kind of areas which um, can often sit on similar or shared books, um, could often have a problem in terms of um, some cross pollination or some issues um, with the portfolios that are being managed by the same groups. Um, and so whether or not that facilitates more lending into shipping because it looks better than the other sectors, it, perhaps that's the way, um, the way forward. And also, I mean, I think one advantage for ship finance is is actually the fact that we have a very muted order book at the moment. We are likely to end up moving in the next few years to a position where there will be many more fi um, projects to finance. There will be propulsion systems to back and there will be, you know, kind of new green ESG type projects which will need backing from, from banks. So, I mean, the, an advantage for ship finance in terms of a real business opportunity will be, if they can do their homework properly, the uh, banks that get behind the right projects and, and back the right kind of technologies going forward. Great. Thank you very, very much. Andrew? Yeah, thank, thank you, Dimitris. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, we, have, uh, we have a lot of questions that have come in from the audience, so there's definitely not enough time to go through them all. Um, I'm going to pick just uh, three or four questions, and if you can keep your answers short, in the interest of time, please. Um, so one question is uh, on uh, M&A, saying with with pr with uh, price to net asset values low at the moment, will there be more activity in the M in, in for mergers and acquisitions in the industry? Uh, maybe Choi Yan. Well, I I believe there's definitely um, opportunities, and as I mentioned earlier, COVID-19 will be a reset, and uh, in the tanker space in particular. Um, with demand dropping, I think, um, and, and also with the focus on um, IMO 2030 and IMO 2050, um, the smaller players um, will likely find it difficult um, to continue in this space, you know, and also um, matching the, the environmental agenda. So there will be consolidation, there will be many opportunities. Um, I suppose um, it depends on what sort of um, synergy that can be derived from, from the m &As, you know, the usual um, considerations that have to be made. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question on um, crew changes uh, that you touched upon in the beginning of the discussion. Um, so the question is, uh, in response to the crew changing issues, what is the position of owners and charters with respect to B the BIMCO crew change clause, which is so far uh, which, which so far the majority has have not been accepted by charters. Are you familiar with the with the BIMCO crew change clause, Alan? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, look. I mean, so, so certainly what we've tried to do with with our charters and across the board is to try and ensure that I mean we actually have a lot of our ships commercially run by third parties, and so we're we're always trying to make sure that we've got wording. In the in the voyage um, charters that are that are being entered into, that protects us as owners, that protects um, the charters to a degree as well, and, and that is balanced in that respect and takes into account what's going on in the world at the moment. Um, we've seen some pushback, as you always do, with new wording that comes into the into the market. We've certainly tried to be reasonable and accommodating where we can be, but there are some things that that we do want to see um, put into voyage charters to make sure that any issue that does arise. You know, we we can we can ensure that we're protecting our stakeholders 
and, and also the crew and, and, and everyone else involved. Thanks. Uh, anyone else on that issue? I mean, no. I can say we, we had some days of off hire because we had to deviate vessels and uh, we, we didn't find common grounds with uh, with the charters. And mm. This is the situation in, in COVID-19 uh, and uh, this is uh, what I mentioned earlier, there's increased cost. Mm. Okay, thanks. So uh, uh, one more question, uh, kind of a chicken and egg question. Um, is it the availability of finance or the availability of projects which determine investment decisions? Marcus? Project. Very clear. Um, <laughs> uh, Cho Yang? Project as well. Mm. Okay. And... Uh, what do you think? Sorry? I said, Alan, what do you think? Because, you know, so Alan, Alan's smiling. If somebody were to give you money, would you find a project? I mean, I see no real shortage of projects in what we're looking at. We've certainly got things that we could work on and, and make returns that are that are above what I'm seeing certain capital be deployed on. I mean, it, it's financing in different in different pockets as well. It's uh, there, there. I do think there's debt finance for the right types of projects, if you can find it. Um, directional equity is a little bit more difficult to come by. Um, and and that clearly is 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 more challenging, and I think that's one of the things that's holding back um, further investment. I, I think there are projects there. It depends what you're looking for, really. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, a, a question on scrapping. Uh, what do you foresee as scrap as the scrapping age in tanker types in 2020, 2021? How long do rates need to be low to induce scrapping in the shipping sectors due to reduced demand from COVID? Um, scrubber economics, high sulfur fuel versus low sulfur fuel, justified or deferred until spread large enough? Your views? And we have seen it in the past that um, that even if markets are terrible, um, scrapping not necessarily picks up to levels where it should go to, simply because even if an owner loses breath, there's another owner picking up the vessel, continue to trade, burn some some money, and then move on if it doesn't work out. If it works out, maybe recoup the, the loss in between. Um, but um, I, I think the industry has shown a certain resilience to avoid scrapping um, that may have been counterproductive in recovering in the industry. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think I think you do see a, a reticence to to scrap. I think um, clearly we've just had some fairly buoyant markets, you know, particularly in Q2. And I think from the tanker's perspective, and so that always makes it a harder decision to to part with an asset which you think can uh, generate that kind of income. A, a lot of it's going to be driven by the the capex cycle. So so where are you on your you know, kind of at 17 years for your uh, intermediate or hitting 20 for your fourth special? And, and, and what the, the outlay is going to be, what's what's the condition of the ship, how well maintained has it been? And, and then it's a, a, a decision around the, the cost benefits of, of, of keeping her on the water or scrapping her today. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I do see uh, scrapping going forward. I mean, sorry, just 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 one minute. Um, it will increase over the next one, two years for tankers in particular, not just because of the existing low rates, but also because the, the fact that uh, the general um, tankers each, especially on the VLCC side, are actually quite high. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Choyan. Um, so uh, a final question. Uh, with so much uncertainty and, and, and variables impacting on investment decisions, sh such as short-term economic, um, uh, slow economic growth in the short term, longer term, uh, other you know new fuels and technologies and propulsion systems and all that, what investments make sense for your respective organizations in, in today's market? Andrew, Andrew, I'm sorry. I think we covered that. I think we covered that before. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it was it was covered earlier. Just, but just let's just let's just close with this one. Um, you know, just in in you know in one sentence, what makes sense? What makes sense for you today? Cho Yang. Yeah. Um, for for AT, um, we will still continue um, to to grow our brand uh, in the tanker space. 
Um, but going forward, in terms of our long-term uh, agenda, we will definitely um, be observing how the, um, the market will evolve, um, especially on the energy transition part, as well as uh, eventually what could be the, the long-term solution uh, to enable us to achieve the 2050 IMO target. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marcus? Um, basically, it's transactions where our downside risk is covered, I think, in the current times, and especially for us being um, listed. It doesn't go down very well if we take speculative long positions where we really don't know how long the pandemic will last and what the impact in the end on, on the real economy will be. Mm -hmm. Alan? Um, I mean, I, I think we touched upon it before. I prefer at this point in time secondhand than, than the new build, and we can see projects now with you know 15% plus cash on cash yields for ships that are in our segment, um, if not better. And so we think there are projects out there. And, and if it's not to buy, then perhaps we can structure something around charter with options and, and other things like that. So very much incremental growth at this point in time, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. And Dimitris, I mean, uh, from your perspective, what are, what are you seeing in the market these days? In terms of investments? Yes. Well, I think you said, <laughs> Now you put me on the spot, Andrew. Okay. <laughs> I didn't see that coming. Um, to be very honest with you, most of the things we're working on uh, relate to refinance, either of uh, balloons or of, uh, of clients trying to find the opportunity to, if you want, uh, release equity from their ships. Very few, very few, if you want, new investments. Very similar if you want to what uh, so young Alan and, and Marco said, okay, like people are not actively buying, let me put it this way, okay, uh, they're definitely eyeing, obviously, you know, the tanker owners have had a great, if you want, second half of 2019 and first half of 2020, now they are, you know, being a little bit more conservative, okay, but the dry bulb is there, I think they would like to see how long, how well the market will do, but you know, to answer your question, I think it's mostly if you want refinancing, uh, releasing equity, cleaning up, you know, if you want your the balance sheet instead of, you know, actively uh, going into the market and looking for projects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Dimitris, Choyang, Marcus and Alan, thank you again for being with us today. Um, also, thank you to uh, Hubertus and David for their presentations earlier in the session. For those in the audience listening in, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website later today or tomorrow. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email in the coming days with some contact details. So if your question wasn't answered today, I know there was more than a few questions. So if your question wasn't uh, answered today, you can follow up um, with our speakers later this week. Uh, please note that the next session of our virtual Marine Money Ship Finance Week, session four, will be hosted live from our New York office later today at 10 p.m. Singapore time or 10 a.m. New York time. And the theme of that discussion, of that session, will be um, ESG, investing and shipping, a roadmap for the future. So please be sure to register and join us for that. That brings us to the end of today's broadcast uh, from our Singapore office. Uh, and at Marine Money, we thank you once more for tuning in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.